بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير وبعد السلام عليكم Alhamdulillah, we are on page 110 and 110, 111. We, we began part two of this book, which is titled The Blessed Names. And we said that this section will take uh, a bit of time because it's a very long section all talking about the names of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned last class that there's a principle which says, Kathratul Asma tadullu ala sharafil musamma. The abundance of names indicates the, nobili- the nobility of the one named. So the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam is Ashrafu Shurafa, the noblest of the noble, it follows that he is also given many names. And we've spoken in the session before the last session about the history of these different names that have been collected and cataloged and explained across Islamic history. And we remarked that many of these names are awsaf, meaning they are descriptions, descriptive names drawn from different aspects of his character or different descriptions of his actions or even belongings. Sometimes he's given names that designate him as the possessor of something. So for instance, you have a name mentioned such as Sahib uh, al the one or the possessor of the turban. Now obviously he's not the only one with the turban. Tur- turbans predated the Prophet ﷺ. But one hadith mentions that the turban is Taj al-Arab. It's like the crown of the Arabs. And there's a distinction given to his turban. And so for that reason, they give him this name because he wore it frequently and he spoke about it and its virtues. So we left off on page 110, 11. Yeah, really page 111. Yes, Kunya's descriptive names uh, names that are derived from some of his actions. So it's not that these names are explicit names mentioned in the Quran. Many of them are, uh, but most of them are awsaf, they're descriptions. And that's why we have so many. So we begin on page 111, where the author talks about the name Muhammad. And we spoke about this a little bit in the previous class. I think we read up to the first half of this page. So just to uh, review what we said, the name Muhammad comes from a three-letter root. What is the three-letter root? Hamd. So you say Hamida, right? Yahmadu. So Hamida means to praise. If a person praises a lot, then you put it on the form of fa'ala. You add the shadda in the middle, in the the ayn of the verb. So you would say hamada. So hamada, yuhamidu. And that action is called tahmid. So tahmid is for us to say alhamdulillah. It can also be ikhtisar al-hikaya. It can also be the short form of a phrase. So 
the one who does that frequent praise, we will call them Muhammad with a kasra. So ismu fa'il on that form for that for that form is mufa'il. So Muhammad. The one who is the object of that praise is on the form of Mufa'al. Hence we get the name Muhammad with a fatha. Uh, this is the linguistic, uh, the morphological root of the name. So what it means, if, if Hamida means to praise, and Hamada means to praise frequently or abundantly, the one who praises abundantly is Muhammad, and the one who is praised abundantly by others is Muhammad. Yes? Yes. But we have that meaning in his other name, Ahmed, because it implies that he is the one who praises the most. Right? So you have the two famous names, Muhammad and Ahmed. Now the hadith tells us that he is known as Muhammad among the inhabitants of the earth, and he is known as Ahmed in the heavens, in the heavenly realms. But he is, of course, Ahmad. And the difference is that Ahmad is uh, ismu tafdil. We call that a superlative noun. Uh, the one who praises the most. Now there's a discussion here among the ulama. Because Ahmad can mean the one who himself praises the most. But it can also mean the one who is praised by others the most, more than anyone else among creation. The stronger view is that Ahmed refers to himself, as him being the one who praises Allah more than anyone else. But the second meaning is also correct. He says here that Muhammad is an intensified word from the root word of Hamd, meaning to praise. Hence the name Muhammad comes from praise and it means the one who is praised abundantly. Uh, and Imam Al-Qastalani, who was the author of Al-Mawahib Al-Ladunniya, uh, he says, he is mentioned that Allah named the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with this name 2000 years before the creation. Now Al-Qastalani is a later scholar and he is compiling a work of seerah and shama'il and khasais into one large work of three volumes titled Al-Mawahib Al-Ladunniya. It is a relied upon book, especially in the latter period of Islamic history. And it has a, a seven or eight volume commentary by Al Imam Al-Zurqani. And it's a really valuable work However, because it is a later work, he's, he cites not as a muhaddith who is just transmitting narrations. He's also compiling and explaining and refining and going into discussions. What that means is that just because it's recorded there doesn't mean it's the, the final statement on the issue. Sometimes these authors compile things because they're out there in the tradition. They've been recorded and they put it there. It takes the scholar to do tahqiq, which is to actually look at the narration and say, I'm not citing this and giving it authority just because Qastalani cited it. Well, obviously he got it from somewhere. So where did he get that from? Let me dig further and then compare and contrast and reconcile that with other narrations. He says here, however, Imam Muslim has related from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, 
Allah Azza wa Jal wrote the destiny of all the creation 50,000 years before He created the heavens and the earth. From among that which He wrote in the dhikr, and this would be Ummul Kitab, which is the source of the books, Ummul Kitab, was Muhammadun Rasulullah. So this hadith in Muslim is obviously stronger than an isolated report that doesn't, it's not really authentically established. Now he mentions a narration that we had actually mentioned some months back. And this comes from Ibn Asakir, the author of Tariq Dimashq, which is a massive work spanning some 40 volumes called The History of Damascus. It's not just history though. It has hadith compilations, it has biographies, it has lots of information. So Ibn Asakir is relied upon hadith scholar, although not every single hadith in the collection is going to be sahih, like Bukhari or Muslim. But he relates this in its sound from Ka'ab al-Ahbar, who said, and Ka'ab al-Ahbar is a convert who is relating a lot of the Jewish and Christian lore, a lot of the Israeliyat narrations that we find in tafsir are coming through Ka'ab al-Ahbar. He says, Allah gave Adam staffs, you know, sticks, staffs by the number of the prophets and the messengers. Allah then approached his son Sheth and said, my son, you are my Khalifa after me. So take these with taqwa and hold fast to it. Every time you remember Allah, alongside him remember the name of Muhammad, for I saw his name written upon the pillars of the throne whilst I was between spirit and clay. I then circum circumambulated, circled, the heavens, and there was not a single space in the heavens except that I saw the name of Muhammad written there. I saw the name of Muhammad written upon the chest of the Huris, upon the vine leaves of paradise, and upon the leaves of the tree of Tuba. I saw his name upon the leaves of a Sidratul Muntaha, the furthest low tree, upon the sides of the veils and between the eyes of the angels. Therefore be abundant in remembrance of him for the angels remember him in every moment. So this hadith is sound. And what it tells us is that the name Muhammad itself, and in some narrations, the formula of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, and in some narrations, just Muhammadun Rasulullah, these are written all across Jannah and in the heavenly realms and even upon some of Allah's choice creation among the angels and Hurra'in and others. This indicates the lofty status of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa He says, citing a hadith recorded by Ibn Asakir, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when I was raised to the heavens during the Mi'raj, I saw written upon the throne, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah. Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. I have supported him with Ali. So this narration, from the hadith standpoint, it's not a sahih hadith, right? Which means that when we relate it, we would say that it is transmitted that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said this. But it is from the shawahid, meaning there's so many narrations like this of different grades of authenticity. They all speak to a reality that's, that we affirm. In another hadith recorded by Ibn Asakir, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, when I was raised to the heavens, I saw written upon the throne, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr is the voracious, a Siddiq, 
Umar is the distinguisher, al faruq Uthman is the possessor of two lights, Dhu'l-Nurayn. This is also, this is da'if, it's a weak hadith. But it's again transmitted. The fact that there's so many of these tells you something. That's a specialized science. You would have to examine the chain of transmission. Somebody like us, they would know, right? Yeah, unless you're taking from an authority who has done the work, or they're citing the expert work of those hadith scholars who have analyzed the chain. It's a spe- it takes specialized training to do that. Basically, you have to determine, well, where is it sourced? Uh, what is the chain of transmission? What is the status of these narrators? Uh, are there any uh, ilal, any defects within the chain that would render it a weak hadith? And again, talking about hadith sciences, we have grades of hadith, right? We have sahih, you have hasan, and you have da'if. Da'if doesn't, if you look at a scale of 100 to 0, like a school grade, a da'if hadith doesn't mean it's a zero. It doesn't mean it's a zero. A zero would be a forgery, which is not even real. Uh, it's fab- just completely fabricated. fabricated. But there are, yes. Um, a weak hadith, it depends on the level of weakness. Some may be at a grade of 65 or 70, some may be 30 or 40 or 50. It all depends on the level of weakness. Right, so you have extremely weak hadith, which we know for a fact were not uttered by the Prophet Sallallahu You have others that are not extremely weak, and they may even be supported by other narrations that are sound. So the hadith sciences are very complex. In the area, however, of virtuous actions, or fada'il and manaqib, we're a bit more easygoing. So if we're grading hadith, as a, if a scholar is grading hadith, if the hadith concerns core matters of iman, or if the hadith concerns something about halal and haram, or Islamic legal rulings about what makes something valid or invalid, then the level of strictness is going to be much higher because those things have an immediate impact on people, right? But if the hadith is about a virtuous action that we already know is virtuous, like salah, and it's a weak hadith, then we can use those hadith uh, as an encouragement to good deeds with some guidelines. Like we're not ascribing them directly to the Prophet ﷺ, but we can use them. Likewise, if the hadith is weak, but it concerns virtuous qualities, manaqib and fada'il of people or khasa'is, if the hadith is weak, but it concerns those topics, the hadith scholars will generally be more lenient in narrating them because although the hadith has weakness, it's not a matter of halal and haram, and its content is generally supported by things that we already know to be true. Does that make sense? Why have the scholars not kind of gotten rid of the weak or the fabricated hadith? Why are they still out there? Because it confuses a lot of people, you know. Well, the question is how would you get rid of them? The scholars would know, right? So if a, if a scholar is writing a book, and if he's writing a book of fiqh, definitely he should endeavor to not mention those kinds of hadith. And most bona fide scholars uh, endeavor to do exactly that. So when they're narrating or when they're writing a book about a particular topic, they'll avoid them. But if they're writing a book about virtuous actions or manaq, virtuous uh, qualities, they will include them because, well, number one, they're often writing to an educated audience of uh, younger scholars who have some training and know how to sift. 
A lot of times the books that we're reading were not originally written for everyday people to read. Right? I, I, I'll give you a really good example. Imam al-Tabari. Imam al-Tabari, he has two famous works. Uh, among many. He has his tafsir. And then he has his book of history. Tariq al-Umam wal rusul or Tariq al-Umam wal-Muluk. That book of history, he explains it in the introduction that he gathered whatever he could come across, narrating and documenting historical periods and people and incidents. And he cites for each of these the chains of narration. And he says that his purpose behind this was cataloging it for future scholars, for people to reference. So he's writing this book for scholars. He's essentially telling them a lot of this stuff is not even true, but it's documented, and it has a chain of narration. So it is for you, the scholar, to have this available to you, for you to investigate and sift through. And that means that if you are a trained scholar in, in hadith and you know how to sift through these things, you would approach that book of history with that in mind. So as you're reading the book, you're analyzing the chains of transmission. You're not taking everything at face value. But here's where the problem lies. That book gets published in Arabic. It later gets translated into English. The entire thing is translated, by the way. We have mo most of it in the library. Uh, an ordinary Muslim wants to learn about history, but they don't have training in the hadith sciences. And they're probably skipping the introduction. <laughs> so that means they're opening the book of history written by Imam al-Tabari, assuming that all of this is just history. And all of these things took place exactly as they're described. And they read really scandalous and ugly things. And they're not sure what to make of this and that. And they get confused. I've, I've dealt with a few people who had that problem. They come to me with a very strange ideas that they got from reading the book of Imam al-Tabari, his book of history. And they're totally confused until I explain to them, listen, look at what he says in the introduction. You can't take every single thing at face value. You have to be able to analyze. And you can't do that unless you have the skills for going through the chains. That's a specialized skill. So if you got rid of them, it doesn't solve the problem. First, you can't do that. It's just not possible. What is left is for scholars to write books for ordinary people that don't mention those things. So that when the ordinary Muslim is reading a book, number one, the hadith are cited. They at least know where they're from. And number two, they have an idea about the status of the hadith. What is the grading of the hadith? And sometimes there's differences of opinion. Sometimes a scholar would say one hadith is da'if, the other says it's hasan, the other says even sahih. Sometimes there's differences. Um, it's a long topic, but this book is largely about virtues and unique qualities which means that the standard is not going to be as stringent as a book detailing halal and haram. Does that make sense? So I, I do try to take it upon myself to mention if it's da'if. If for no other reason, then we're mindful of that. And if we cite it, we're more careful by saying it is related that the Prophet Sallallahu said this. So this is what we say, Sighatu Tamrid, Yuqal, it is said or it is related. You're not, you're not uh, insisting that this is definitely his statement. It's mentioned. But because of all of these meanings are already corroborated in sound hadith, we know that they're generally true. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. can be used out of context. Like the other day a sister telling me something and I said, you don't base a ruling on a hadith. Yeah. Right? Like there's Muslims who think, oh, I can go to the book, read a hadith, 
and then based on that hadith, I can come up with a ruling. Yeah, there's a. Or they don't understand the context of that particular hadith. They'll be talking about how the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, you couldn't even make them out. Well, if you understand the context of that hadith, they were out in the dark night, and it was really, really dark, right? So even a sahih hadith can be um, used in the wrong context, too, and can be dangerous. Yeah, I'd like, uh, uh, yes. even like, for example, government, why would he use a very hadith in his book, you know? He's not using it to make a point of law. He's cataloging what's out there. What is the work of a historian? The historian is collecting the data. Now, there are certain historians who are approaching history critically. It's a critical study of history. So they're using the data set, and they're verifying what is true from what is not true. They're weighing the various narrations and then they're saying this is most likely what happened this is unlikely that for sure didn't happen that's the critical job of his of a historian but then you have other historians who are not engaged in the critical work but they're engaged in the cataloging and collecting of that data set so if the historian is a critical historian he has to work with materials. Where is he getting the materials? He's getting the materials from his predecessors who have done the work of collecting what's out there. It is his job as the critical historian to, to use his skills to sift between the different narrations and figure out what really happened, what likely happened, what couldn't have happened. So Imam al-Tabari's role in his book of history was not as the critical historian as much as it was cataloging what is, what is in writing and what has been narrated and passed on, leaving that job for those who come after him. So you find the books of history written after him, some of them follow in his footsteps, cataloging, some, follow, some are more critical, in taking out those narrations that are clearly not valued. For example, Saif ibn Umar. Saif ibn Umar is a notorious narrator. And Saif ibn Umar has a lot of historical material, stories, narrations, that all end up with him in the chain. They all go back to him. Well, Saif ibn Umar is rejected. He was a Nasibi. He had very open and clear animosity towards Imam Ali. So you find all these narrations that paint Imam Ali in a bad light and valorize his enemies. And what do you see? Oh, Saif ibn Umar is there. Oh, how convenient, how interesting. But if you already know he's rejected, you don't have to worry so much about the content because the con content it's just him. That's it. But people are reading those books and they don't know that. And they read the narration. Oh, and this happened. This one brother came to me. He was reading Tabari's history. And he came to me very troubled. So I said, bring me this narration or these narrations that are troubling you. He brings them. I look in the chain. Ah, oh, Saif ibn Omar. As I suspected. I said, there's your problem right there. But you would have known that if A, you read the introduction of Imam al-Tabari and, re and realized what he's doing, and B, if you knew who he was. But you would not know who he was unless you had that kind of training. And people who don't have the training, they just read it all and take it uncritically as if it's all historical fact, and it's just not the case. All right? And the same goes for his tafsir. His tafsir, he does offer tafsir for sure. But in many or most cases, he's transmitting what has been collected about the tafsir of this and that verse. Now he has his own views, and those are valuable, and the narrations are valuable, but you have to be able to sift, and that sifting requires knowledge of uh, the hadith sciences. Okay. 
Where are we? Ah, page 113. 112 at the bottom. Ah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, When I was raised to the heavens, I did not, not pass by a single heaven, but that I saw my name written upon it. Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. This is recorded in the Musnad of Imam al-Bazzar. In the next hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, Written upon the door of the Garden of Paradise is La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. This is Ibn Asakir as well. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said, There's not a tree in the Garden of Paradise except that upon its leaves is written La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. So there's a lot of narrations like this. And some of these are weak, some of them are sound, but they collectively speak to a meaning that we know to be affirmed. So if one is weak, it doesn't mean that the idea is false because we have other sound narrations which attest to the soundness of that. And just because a hadith is categorized as da'if, doesn't always mean that it's false. That's something we have to correct too. A lot of people think that, oh, the hadith is da'if, which means is batil. It's false. It's not true at all. It is not true at all. Uh, Imam Ibn al-Salah mentions in his work on hadith sciences that when the hadith scholars say that a hadith is da'if, it is possible that it is actually from the words of the Prophet It's just from that particular chain, there's weakness. So you'd find other chains that are sound, that relate the same meaning, sometimes even the same statement. So it's a very precise science, and we have to be careful. Um, but that's for another class. Uh, now he mentions a narration from Ibn Abbas. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this narration. And yeah, this will probably be the end of the class. Uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, Allah revealed to Isa alayhi salam, believe in Muhammad and order those from the community who will reach him to believe in him. Now that part is corroborated by the Qur'an. The Qur'an supports that meaning, correct? In Surah Al-Hashr, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ And I'm giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmed. He says, for, it was, for if it was not for Muhammad, I would not have created Adam, nor the garden, nor the fire. I created the throne upon water, and it convulsed, or shook. So I wrote upon it, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, and it became still. So this hadith uh, is also uh, da'if, it's also a weak hadith. But its meaning is supported by other proof texts. And I wanted to use the mention of this narration as an opportunity to go a little bit into this issue. There is a narration that is not even a hadith. It's not a hadith, but it's said to be a hadith, which in Arabic reads as لَوْ لَاكَ لَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْأَفْلَاكَ So you hear this rhyme. The meaning of that narration is, were it not for you, I would have not created the cosmos. Were it not for you, addressing the Prophet Sallallahu I would not have created the universe. Now this narration is not even a narration. It is cataloged by Imam Mullah Ali Al-Qadi in his book on mawdu'at, on uh, forged or fabricated narrations. 
They're not even weak hadith. They're just not even hadith at all. They're not ascribed to the Prophet Wasallam. But for one reason or another, they get ascribed to him and they're considered by some to be hadith, but they're not even hadith. No chain of narration, no source. They're just out there floating around. And eventually they become uh, a part of the popular jargon that people mistakenly ascribe them to the words of the Prophet ﷺ. This statement that is ascribed to Ibn Abbas, which is also weak, has a very similar statement to that fabricated narration. Now the fabricated narration says, were it not for you, I would not have created the cosmos. This narration says, were it not for Muhammad, I would, have not, I would not have created Adam, nor the garden, or the fire. So it's very similar in meaning. One is da'if, the other is a fabrication. But here's something interesting. Mula'ari al-Qari, the famous uh, hadith scholar and Hanafi jurist and master of the Qira'at of Mecca, originally from Herat, Afghanistan. Mula'ari al-Qari, he catalogs this hadith or this narration in his collection of forgeries. Mentions that it is forged, but after citing it, he says, Ma'nahu sahih. However, its meaning is correct. Its meaning is correct. This may be surprising to some people. Why would he cite this as a forgery, but then say its meaning is correct? Some people would say, Doesn't, isn't that a kind of ghulu? Isn't that a kind of an exaggeration about the status of the Prophet How can that meaning be correct when Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَىٰ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind or jinn except to worship me. Isn't that the purpose of existence? And if so, how would we reconcile that with this narration, which seems to indicate that the purpose of creation is uh, the Prophet ﷺ? This is where it's really important to be educated in the deen, <laughs> because both of them are correct, both of them are true, but it's only when you understand what is meant by it. So when you go into the Turath, the broader Islamic tradition, hadith commentaries, books of theology, books of spirituality, seerah, shima, and you name it, what you find is that Mula Ali Al-Qari's statement that the meaning is correct, is very normative in the Islamic tradition, meaning he's not some dissenting voice where the majority were opposed to him in this. No, what he says corresponds to what many others before him have said and many others after him. For example, way before him, you have Ibn Rajab al-Hambali, he's a great Hanbali Imam. He mentions about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. He is the ultimate purpose behind creating the human race. He is its essence, Ainuhu, its quintessence, Khulasatuhu, and its very epitome, Wasidatu Iqdihi. And then you go before him to the great Hanbali Imam Ibn al Jawzi. Ibn al Jawzi who also considers that hadith a forgery, he says, he goes even further than Ibn Rajab. And he says that the awliya and the salihun are the very purpose of creation. Al awliya wa salihun humul maqsood min al kawn. The very purpose of creation. Who is the head of the salihun and the awliya? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Sayyid Al-Awliya was Sayyid Al-Salihin So that's been Babi Awla even more so So to explain what that means 
to give it a proper interpretation, I want to read to you a, a kind of commentary on what it means and a correct interpretation that situates it properly in our theology. And I'm not going to say who is saying this until I get to the very end. Why am I doing that? Because you have sectarian divisions in our communities and it's all based on following people and personalities. It's not about the content of what they say. So let's say if I, Imam Ghazali talks about this in Al Munqid min al Dalal. He quotes the statement of Imam Ali radiallahu anhu who says, uh, if you know the truth, you know men. You do not know, you do not uh, know men to know the truth. I'm paraphrasing here. The idea is that a statement is either true or false because of the content of what is said, not the one saying it, right? If a Satan worshiper magician says, justice is good. Do I reject what he said because of who he is? No. And if my best friend who is a Muslim says justice is bad, or you know, I'm just giving you an imaginary scenario here, obviously, I wouldn't say, yeah, yeah, because you're my, you're my friend. No. I, I know of a teacher who he, he played this trick on students. These students had a particular ideological affiliation, which means that they only look up to a certain number of scholars and these other people, they don't like them at all. So what did he do? He took the statements of some of these other scholars they don't like, he took the quotes from those scholars, and then at the end of each quote he would say, قَالَهُ الشَّيْخِ fulani said by so-and-so of someone they like. So he presented these quotes to them. They read them. Oh, mashaAllah, it's beautiful. Excellent. And then he took statements from the scholars they like and then collected these quotes and under each quote he put the name of some scholars they don't like. And they read the list and they, yeah, uh, this is a problem, you know. We can't really accept this. And then he told them what he did and they were shaken. Because they recognized in real time that they were accepting something, not because of the content of what is said, but by who is saying it. And if they liked the person, they would agree with what is said. If they didn't like the person, they would find some way to disagree with it, right? I one time did this too. I was being naughty. This is many years ago. There was a scholar in Saudi Arabia who was not very popular with uh, some other people. And he was seen as kind of a reformer. They didn't like him. Uh, so I was in a community of people who didn't speak Arabic. They know of these people, but they don't speak Arabic. So that author that they didn't like wrote a book on uh, Uzla, a, a book on withdrawing from society versus intermingling with people in society. So I gave uh, the author, Sheikh Salman al Auda, uh, Asra. Sheikh Salman al Auda is a great scholar, and, but they don't like him. So what I did is I said, this is a book written by uh, Sheikh Al-Allama Ibn Fahd al I didn't say Al-Awda, Sheikh Ibn Fahd, something like this. So they didn't pick up on it being that guy that they don't like. They had no idea. So I'm going through the book and I'm translating and explaining it and they're loving it. Like this is great stuff. Except I never told them who it was. <laughs> I don't know what would happen if I did that, but... Uh, but whatever you were saying was all correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was correct. The point is, if I had said that this is written by this person, they would, they would, they would have automatically 
close their ears to it. It wasn't about the content, it was about the one saying it. This is a problem. So I want to read to you a quote. And afterwards, I'll tell you who said it. The excellence of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over the angels was demonstrated on the night of the ascension, Laylatul Mi'raj, when he reached a station where he heard the scratching of the pins. He was now at a station higher than even that of the angels. Now Allah manifests some of his tremendous power and astounding wisdom through righteous humans via prophets and saints in ways he does not do even via angels. For he combined in the former qualities that are dispersed throughout the other types of creation. So Allah created man's physical body from the earth, whereas his spirit, his ruh, was created from the highest assemblies of angels. This is why it has been said that man is a microcosm but contains the macrocosm. Now, the Prophet Muhammad is the master of humanity, the best of creation, and the noblest of them in the sight of Allah. Which is why it is said, Allah created the universe because of him, or but for him he would not have created the throne, the footstool, the heavens, the earth, the sun, or the moon. But this isn't a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, neither authentic nor weak, not even a hadith. It has not been reported by any of those versed in the hadith science, on the authority of the Prophet ﷺ, nor is it known to have come from any companion. In fact, it is not known who uttered it. So here he's talking about Lawlaq, Lama Khalaqtul Aflaq, the narration that Mullah al Qari cited as a forgery. Nonetheless, it is possible to explain it from a sound perspective, such as with Allah's statement. He has subjected to you whatever is in the heavens and the earth. He has subjected to man. Made, made everything in the heavens and the earth subjected for the use of mankind. Or by his words, subhanah, he subjected the ships to you that they may run upon the sea at his command and subjected the rivers to you. He subjected to you the sun and moon constant in their courses, and subjected to you the night and the day, and gave you of all you ask of him. And if you count the favors of Allah, you will never number them. There are other verses, he says, similar to these, all of which clarify that Allah created creation for the sake of mankind, even though it is known that in doing so, Allah had another wisdom alongside this and greater than this. Here though, Allah explains to mankind the benefits the cre that creation contains for them and how they are immersed in his favors. So when it is said that he did such and such for this or that reason, it does not exclude the possibility that there could be other wisdoms behind the act. Likewise, the statement, were it not for so-and-so, such-and-such would not have been created. This statement does not negate the possibility of there being a higher wisdom behind the act. Instead, what it implies is that since the most pious of people is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, creating him was a desirable end of deep-seated wisdom more than in creating anyone else, and that the perfection of creation and the crown of its completion only occurred with the Prophet Muhammad. Now, since man is the seal of creation, the last of creation, and its microcosm, their best will also be the best of all creation in absolute terms. Since Muhammad is the essence of humanity, the axis of creation and the distributor of the collective, 
He is, so to say, the ultimate purpose behind creating creation. So an objection cannot be raised against the saying, for him all was created. Nor can there be an objection raised against the saying, were it not for him, creation would not have been created. So if these and similar words are explained according to what the Qur'an and the Sunnah indicate, they should be accepted. So if everything was created for mankind and subjugated to mankind, and the greatest of creation, the greatest of humankind is the Prophet Sallallahu And if he is the embodiment of the greatest expression of the human purpose, that this narration, though it's not a hadith, does not in any way contradict the verse that says that mankind and jinn were not created except to worship me. He is the greatest manifestation of that purpose. So this is how you reconcile that statement. The one attributed to Ibn Abbas as well as the one mentioned by Muni Ali al-Qari in light of the verse. Now who said that? Uh, that was said by uh, a sheikh, al-imam, al-allama, Abu al-Abbas, Ahmad, Ibn Taymiyyah al-Harrani. Ibn Taymiyyah, who is, he is a controversial figure, but he is an alim, he is a mujtahid, right? And people are free to agree or disagree with some of his unique views, but in this, he was with everyone else. Right? He's not taking some isolated view. No. Now, if I had quoted this statement of Ibn Taymiyyah to a really super pro Ibn Taymiyyah, Majnoon Ibn Taymiyyah person, and I didn't say it was him, they, would, they might reject it if they didn't know it. But if you put the name Ibn Taymiyyah, now they have less of a problem, right? So this is the purpose of pointing out that we know truth by verifying truth, right? The state. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, for good reason, and <laughs> in some in some in some areas, definitely for good reason. Um, his anti. Shia polemic in Minhaj Sunnah. It is good in many ways, but it's also problematic in several ways, and it's worthy of some critique. But the point of citing from him is that to show number one, this is normative Islam, this understanding of the narration in light of the verse is not some isolated view. It's shared by many different people of different mashadib, different orientations. And the second value of doing it the way I did is just to highlight that importance of uh, coming to verify truth, tahqiq, uh, irrespective of who is saying it, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says in the hadith, al-hikmatu dalatul mu'min, that wisdom is the lost mount or the lost property of the believer. He takes it from wherever he finds it. Um, but you have to, you have to be a mu'min, right? That means you have to have a, the discernment to know whether it's wisdom or foolishness. And you have to be a mu'min. If you're a mu'min, you have that discernment. If you find wisdom, if it's true, fi nafs al-amr, in reality, it's true, no matter who says it. If it's false, it's false, no matter who says it. Right, and there's ways of verifying those things, but yeah, I think we'll we'll stop here. I was I intended to go further, but we had a couple of tangents. Um, what time is it? One. Let me just read this fa this final narration here. Jabir radiyallahu anhu has said. Between the shoulders of Adam was written Muhammadun Rasulullah, the seal of the prophets. This is recorded by Ibn Asakir. Uh, and this is also a weak narration. Uh, in another narration mentioned by Ibn Hibban, it talks about uh, the 
the marks or the seals that were placed on each prophet. It mentions, and this is also coming from, actually this is coming from Wahhab ibn Munabbih, who mentions that every single prophet had a distinguishing mark that was placed on their right hand. And it was only the Prophet ﷺ for whom that distinguishing mark, the seal of prophethood, was placed behind his shoulder blades. Right. And some of the ulama say the reason why there's that distinction is that he was so majestic in his beauty, surpassing theirs, that he didn't, it was a formality to have one like the other prophets, but he didn't need it to be in a very distinct and visible place because his own. Uh, countenance was sufficient as a testimony to his truthfulness. Allahu Alam. So inshallah we'll pick up next week, uh, go into the section on the uniqueness of his name, Muhammad, and then other related fada'il regarding it. And then we get into the narration about Ahmad and some of the titles given to him in the Qur'an. والله ورسوله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم